And let's move to the code of conduct. We don't have that today. There you go. Thank you. Uh, yep. So again, after um, that's the other piece that everybody needs to be familiar with. Welcome to the TSC call. This call is open to everyone and everyone is welcome to participate. Um, but uh, please uh, do respect the code of conduct, which essentially is asking everybody to be a decent person, which I don't think is too much asking. But nowadays it seems like we have to remind people. So there you are, you have been reminded. All right, so I made actually, for those who just opened the, the, the agenda, you may have noticed that I've shifted things around a little bit, but um, basically I think we can do the report first before getting into the discussion. We have a whole bunch of issues we could discuss. I apologize for last week. I could probably have made the call, but I was in Japan. It was really late in the evening. And uh, I thought we could use the time offline to make progress on the issues. I'm sorry to say I, we haven't seen, I haven't seen much traffic or not as much as I expect or hope, but um, so we'll try. <coughs> I to, think there uh, was a flurry, right? When you said there, that. There were some, there were some, yeah. I, yeah. And I appreciate the, you know, those who took the time to comment, thank you. But so in any case, I think we can start with the, the announcement and the quarterly reports, which you know should be pretty quick, and then we can go as much as we can, you know, given the time left on the discussion topics. So without further ado, let's talk about the maintainer summit. Is Dan back on with sound? I don't see Dan. Uh, I know that Salona is on. Salona, if you want to address yeah. this. In regards to the maintainer summit, um, <clears throat> if you want, you can click over to the pages on the wiki where um, Dan and others have been organizing it uh, to sit there and see where the um, the location is and what the registration and the agenda are. Um, and notice the pre-registration is coming up on us very quickly. Do you know how many people have now registered? As of yesterday, we had 40 people registered. Um, uh, so we still have room for more. Yeah, we're quickly reaching the um, the size of the venue, though. Yeah, no, I realize that, but okay, it's it's so that we set the right expectation. I don't want to encourage people to register if we're really over <laughs> overflowing. It's like so there's still room if somebody wants to register. Yeah, if we have a, a few more people, that's probably fine. If we have, you know, 50 more people, that's definitely not fine. Is there is there something in the registration page that will not allow you to register if you pick quorum or capacity? Uh, no clue, Mark. <laughs> okay, I see Dan has joined. Hey, Dan. Yeah, sorry about that. Rejoined. You want to talk about the maintainer summit? What's the status? Yeah, it sounds like you guys were just talking about we're right about at capacity. So I think if there's, um, you know, maybe a maintainer or two out there who hasn't registered, please go ahead and do that. Um, but uh, I think I'm, I'm really happy that we've gotten a really strong turnout. And there's a good starter list of topics. And I've got uh, a couple ideas that we haven't put on there yet. All right, thank you. That's what we wanted to know. Any questions, anybody? If not, we can just move ahead. So the next is the bootcamp. Silona, any updates? Don't hear you. Sorry, mute button. Um, yes, so everything is up and ready to go in regards to the bootcamp Russia. The main thing that we're doing now is working on getting out uh, people to join. We've got a lot of session leaders. We've got a lot of different sessions happening. We've got a lot of different people visiting. One of the major changes that we did is because of having currency issues, um, we took away the sign up fee um, because there were problems with credit cards going through and there were problems with the ruble and et cetera, agnosium. So that's the major thing that got changed. Um, but other than that, we're, I think, at um, about 40. 
but we want to get to closer to 200, but we just had one of the banks sit there and say, we want to bring 30. So we're getting there. It's just a bit slow on the signups. All right. But it's all organized. Okay. Any questions, anyone? Does the uh, drop in the fee impact and anything and significantly for the budget? Wait. Chris, we can't the, hear anything. The fee has never, I'm going to mute Chris first. Okay. Um, the fee has never been anything significant to us. It's only been $25. Um, the only reason we do it is to make sure that no one takes up a spot and then doesn't show up. Um, okay, that so, makes sense. Yeah. And as I recall, uh, we, I, for years, we never collected those fees. Um, it was more of a, of a, a theoretical stick uh, that may have changed, but. It changed. Yeah, we, do actually, we, do actually, we do actually collect those, Rye. Um, it's that uh, previously we um, would occasionally refund them, but we, we're, we, didn't, we haven't been doing that this time. We've just been doing the different fees. Um, so for this one, we refunded the 10 uh, fees that people had actually paid because everyone else who had signed up was a session leader. And so they didn't actually pay. They just used their session leader codes. Um, but for the other people, we're now, uh, we've actually waived it because there were so many problems with payment that it was actually affecting the registration, the ability of individuals to register. So is there anything that needs to be done to make that more known and have crank up the registration numbers? Uh, we're going to go and contact all of our members that are in that area and we're sending them materials. And then we're also going to uh, work with the meetups as well because each of the meetups have about 700 people in them. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this? If not, thank you, Silona. Let's move on. So Sweta sent an email to the list about the DCI working group having drafted a survey and requesting input or feedback. Sweta, you want to say a word about this? Yeah, um, so from the DCI, this is kind of the first thing that we're trying to um, produce and what we've been working on for the last, uh, let's say, couple months. Uh, basically our idea here with this survey is to kind of get a baseline of the community both to figure out kind of what are the demographics that we have and then also kind of understand what their experiences are like in the community um, and we're hoping that if we can come up with a format and a list of questions that we can repeat year after year we'd be able to see or gauge our improvement or hopefully not you know regression over the years as we tried to do different kinds of actions or motions to kind of improve uh, diversity, civility, inclusion in the community. Uh, so just kind of getting some general feedback uh, would be great. And then I think we would want to kind of put this up as like a discussion item in a future TSC meeting. Um, I realize that we could probably put the little review thing and I might go back and edit that after this meeting to add our names at the bottom. Oh uh, yeah, sounds like a good idea. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments for Sweda? Um, hey Shreffa, uh, this is Silas. Uh, yeah, I just had a few, I, I just quickly had, had made a, a, a few on there. Um, so, I'm, so I understand that, that obviously part of the survey is about setting a sort of more statistical baseline. And I think the section two stuff, this is the table, that sort of seems fine. The first section of questions, I, I struggle to find uh, sort of engaging. I mean, my answer to them was like, yes, it's extremely important, but I feel like in answering it, uh, it I'm not sure that the, 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 the surveyor is really learning much about, you know, what I think should be done about it. Um, and I wonder how useful they will be as quantitative questions. And if they're not useful as particularly as quantitative questions, could we recast them as uh, tell us about a time when you felt excluded or tell us about a time when 
you know, X, like something maybe a bit more anecdotal that might guide more statistically minded questions. I just, I don't know, I, I find them kind of not engaging questions in, in the current form. Um, I don't know what other people think. Um, I just don't think I'm giving a lot of information in my answers. Um, oh, and, and then oh, so one last thing, uh, maybe I shouldn't batch them together, but um, yeah, the, the demographic list looks like it's missing at least one continent. Um, I, I wonder if a demographer could help with a, a contemporary list of ethnicities uh, uh, um, that, that might be, uh, <laughs> we don't want to be uh, exclusive in the inclusion survey. Um, <laughs> um. I definitely we'll look at the demographics in terms of the first set of questions. I know this has kind of gone, uh, we've had discussion about what is the value or what are we getting out of it? And I think um, that first set of questions, the whole idea was if we survey the community and perhaps they are a little bit boring, but if they do say, hey, I, you know, gender diversity, regional diversity, civility are not important to us, it kind of gives us an idea of you know, there those are not people we're going to be able to change. Uh, those are not the people we're going to be able to like make differences. Like it, it kind of is some of the blockers that we would have to deal with in trying to bring diversity, civility, and inclusion. At least I think that's the thought process uh, behind those questions. But I do think we can have more discussion about that. Um, I'm sure we will discuss this both offline and in our next meeting. Okay, so one suggestion that's just coming to me, she's saying that, um, I think it would be much more uh, perhaps interesting if you change them into a ranking question, if, that, if that's what you want. So rather than having everyone kind of voting for motherhood and apple pie, um, uh, you know, rank these different forms of inclusion in priority order, I think that would be a much more interesting signal because it, it, you know, it forces people to uh, trade against them rather than just answer as I expect a lot of people would, that you know, they're either important or very important. Okay, that's an interesting idea. I, I kind of like that. Um, again, definitely we'll take it back to the working group and then we can see how that kind of fits in together. All right. Thank you, Silas. Thank you, Sweda. I mean, I don't mean to get into too much discussion on the content. I mostly wanted to take advantage of the call to highlight the call for feedback that's where they sent out on the mailing list. So I invite others to follow through and comments, uh, comment to on the wiki. All right, thank you. So let's move on. Quarterly reports. I just wanted to, I don't think Sophia, I didn't see Sophia on the call. I did have some email exchange with her you may have noticed last time I, I pointed out I was confused because uh, she had filed the Q2 smart contract working group report, but she said, oh, yeah, sorry, that's just a mistake. So this is now been renamed Q3, and she has answered some of the questions, comments that had been posted to the wiki, and she didn't have any specific issues she wanted to bring up to the TSC otherwise. So they are facing, like many other working groups, I would say, uh, issues with regard to participation, but there's nothing unique to it other than that. So we'll see if she ever, you know, if he joins in a further call, we can always, but uh, I mean, if you have questions, the best is to post to the wiki. She is now paying attention. She actually has, was moving and she was busy and for a little while, she was not so responsive, but she has fixed that now, so. I think they also just posted a rough draft to a white paper that she was asking people come and help contribute to. Yes, I saw a note about that, so that's good to bring it up. All right, uh, has Hart joined? So, Ursa, Hart posted, um, a report for Ursa. There was one point he wanted to bring up to the TSE. It's written there right in front of you if you're watching the Zoom window. <clears throat> and it has to do with, you know, trying to get other working group, uh, other projects to use it. 
and to care, which is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, so one thing we've been talking about there is we had started off with, with two ideas. One was where we're all doing some basic things like digital signatures. That's an easy area for everybody to start using the same code and we'd get some um, collective strength out of uh, relying on a uh, more redundantly reviewed set of code for that. But that's also a little bit less interesting maybe for some projects because it's not giving them a new feature. It's just having them maybe replace something they were already satisfied with. Though we did recently see this uh, addition from Iroha. Uh, and then the second area are these newer kinds of cryptographic features. And uh, Indy and Aries have direct motivation from a lot of what the use cases are for their project, but we don't get as much feedback from the other projects. And it's very likely that the other projects have need or would benefit from some of these features, uh, but either they're not cognizant of them because they're not actually in their, their use case pipeline yet, um, uh, or they're, they're just not aware to share those with, with Ursa so that we can help provide those features. Yeah, so there's a call for input there from the maintainers of the other projects, you know, as to what they might want to see out of Ursa that would make it more interesting to them, if anything. Yeah, and it can be fairly high level. I mean, you don't have to mention a specific cryptographic technique or algorithm. It's just like if there's some use case that uh, could be satisfied potentially by a cryptographic use case, then it's also pretty likely that, that one of us um, can help pull something out of the literature for that. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else? Any reactions? Hey, uh, so scary. So I guess, I mean, I know this, there was a discussion way back when, when the Ursa project first came out, but do we really think like writing everything in Rust is actually the best way to get everybody to use this? Well, there's, there's language bindings um, and we can yeah, add I mean, new I, language I, bindings. I mean, I, I get how to use it. Don't get me wrong, right? Uh, I mean, so, I mean, there's like two variations, right? There's kind of like this approach, which I think is one approach and probably makes sense to start out with to a degree. And then there's like, you know, the, um, you know, the AMCL project, right? <clears throat> um, which actually, um, and I'm not saying they did a great job either, um, but, you know, they created, you know, their crypto stuff and they wrote them in like three or four different languages. Ironically, Rust wasn't one, but I know a lot of the uh, original like, um, you know, indie crypto and stuff like that uses like the BLS signatures and things like that that were over there. I, I guess, you know, that's, you know, that's always kind of a concern. Um, I mean, granted, Rust is, you know, cross compatible or whatever that's in there. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I guess maybe maybe one of the things, like you said, like maybe some some of the newer, cooler, or more interesting, you know, algorithms become become more of interest, right? So that people don't have to, you know, go go figure out how to do those. But I don't know. I just it becomes, you know, tougher to do that, right? I mean, the only onus, for example, on like a fabric side that we would have for swapping out a crypto library right now is if somebody gave me a FIPS certified library. Okay. For the crypto we use today, which by the way, as an aside, I kind of have through Red Hat. Cause so I, I think those, I mean, we can talk more about that, but that you, you did ask for that mm -hmm. both from the TSC and the maintainer on the other side. Right. I think that's kind of where, where we got to. I do like your thing of like, you know, where the roadmap of the more, you know, advanced, uh, crypto stuff, I think that becomes probably more intriguing, right? Um, so that projects don't have to uh, implement those things themselves. Yeah, so AMCL, if I'm thinking of the right project, they, they were able to do a lot of languages and that's pretty cool, um, but they do that by having a um, non-optimal approach. So the, sort of an anti-goal for them is optimality. So they're not trying yep. to you know, really push performance. And that's a totally fine design goal. Going with Rust is a little bit different that we are hoping for some performance benefits as well as uh, the, the uh, uh, threading safety and so forth. 
So it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off. You can provide bindings or you can do stuff directly. Um, we're, I don't know if we'd be at a point to switch thinking on implementation language, but right now, as far as the contributors we've got, uh, it's all sort of Rust focused anyway. Is the uh, is a request more around a uh, specific language and then being able to provide that binding for that language? Was that me, Tracy, or? Yeah, I mean, is it like we want it written in Go, and, and therefore, or we need we need the uh, uh, interface I, with Go, and therefore we need the bindings for Go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, the bindings thing is, is okay. And, and I think that would probably be, I mean, that, that would be an amenable approach that's in there, right? I, I guess, look, and we have our issues right now, but look, just like anything, right? Anytime that you add additional stuff, right? There's always issues, right? Yes, we have CGO, right? So clearly we can create Go bindings via, you know, C interface into this type of stuff, right? But, you know, you, you, you're always going to get into, anyway, right? Anytime you try to do stuff that's cross language, cross whatever in there, it just adds additional you know, overhead and stuff like that, right? Um, and, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're really looking to build build cross-platform, right? Look, I mean, some of this is on the open source side. Some of this I can, I'll speak, you know, selfishly as a vendor on some of this stuff. Like, you know, we, we you know, so we, we, we have this and while the world runs on x86 and there's a lot of great stuff in there, we have to build our stuff to run on other platforms, right? Getting Rust to compile on Z is a pain in the ass, a pain in the butt, sorry. Um, so again, right, it just adds an additional like layer of complexity, right, into, into builds, right, e even if you have cross-language bindings, right, because you're still loading something, you still have to compile the other stuff to source, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sorry. a point about this. Not to source. I, I, <laughs> um, I, I don't know what, how Fabric feels about this, but certainly, um, I mean, uh, for Ursa, I am supportive of, of Rust if there was going to be one language things written in. For Burrow, um, we hang on fairly jealously to our single pure Go binary. C Go is is not free in a bunch of ways. You can that are fairly well documented. Um, in particular, building for like Muscle instead of libc, you lose a lot of the benefits um, with some of your reflection and, and and stuff. Once you switch to C Go, it is a. I mean, it, it it kind of looks the same up to a point, but there are a load of gotchas with C Go. So would be a blocker for me using Ursa directly in Burrow. Um, although I think probably we, we do have a C compiled mode for like we use SQLite as an option. So if people want that uh, and possibly we could use it in our a proxy kind of wallet service. Um, but currently it uh, there'd have to be something that I really needed in Ursa to, to drop C, to, to be willing to have C go binaries. Yeah, and I think that's exactly the way to think of this question is we, we know that there's obstacles, whatever they are. Uh, so what is something of value that would rise above the, the obstacles for you? And maybe it's um, uh, with, you've got Itemix stuff in, in Fabric, right? Not right. So we have ID makes okay. and fabric, right? But, and like to your and point, right? You're exactly right though, Dan, on optimization, right? We took the, we build the, uh, we, we take the go stuff, right? And then you're a thousand percent correct that uh, if we took the, even if, if we took the C version of AMCL instead, we would probably get much better, not probably, guaranteed that we would get better performance. <laughs> Yeah, so what, what I was actually getting at is I, I think that ID mix stuff that you have is like RSA uh, style. Uh, they're seal signatures, but they're using these these bigger groups. And so, so there might be newer stuff that we're doing with elliptic curves. So I, I don't know if that's interesting. I don't know if there's even an awareness of that. But that's uh, kind of just if may I jump here. So there the, is. this is Angelo. So we are using already elliptic curve. Okay. And we also have an implementation of delegatable credentials for, uh, for uh, in Go directly. But do you have an estimation of how much can be the penalty of using the, the, the bindings? I didn't quite hear that. How much could what? 
the penalty of using the bindings. So suppose that we want to use that or someone wants to just fork Fabric and then wants, or any other project and wants to use uh, um, this Rust library. So what will be the penalty in, uh, for, uh, for, because the Rust can be efficient, but then if you pay a lot in the, in the bindings, uh, you know, you are actually losing. So what's, uh, do you have an estimation for that? I don't have any reason to think that there's much cost, but I don't have any, any numbers to back that. Do you have a, yeah, a, a, a that, I was thinking to this other aspect. Uh, you know, if uh, it, it's very, it's very interesting to, to have the same library shared by multiple projects, but it also poses a risk uh, in the sense that if the library has a bug, this bug will be immediately, uh, will immediately be uh, effective on all these platforms in, at the same time. Um, so is there, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's, it's better to have uh, this, the implementation of the same algorithm done by multiple people, like you would do in the, in the, in the distributed algorithms. And then, you know, if one has a bug, you still have other platforms without, without the bug, uh, this kind of thing. So any, any thought about that? Yeah. Um, so the idea is that if we've got more review focus on one library, that library is more likely to be robust. Uh, whereas if we each project has separate implementations, then it's more likely one of those implementations has a flaw. Uh, in order for the logic to hold that you've got multiple implementations um, leading to more strength of a network, then you have to have that entire network drawing from those different implementations. So like if you've got a fabric network, but that fabric network is only using the fabric implementation, it doesn't matter that Sawtooth also has a separate implementation because those aren't on the same network. All right, so I don't want to get too deep into this discussion. I'm happy to see some technical discussion <laughs> for the technical strength committee. It's actually not that common, unfortunately. So I didn't want to cut it short either, but uh, I think I'm happy we're having a discussion and uh, hopefully this can continue offline. So yeah, I thought that was good and helpful. And so if anybody wants to do that live, we've got the weekly URSA meetings. Otherwise, uh, I think general preference towards async communication on the lists or chat. I think it, yeah, yeah. So that, that would be good. I think this is what the URSA working group uh, oh, project is asking to have this kind of interaction so they understand better what might be the resistance to using URSA or what might make it more attractive. So I think it's good to have this discussion. All right, with this, let's move on. So there was a report posted by David Fueling on Quilt. Uh, he actually brought up a question in his report. I think we mostly addressed it in comments. Uh, I don't know if David is on. But uh, essentially, you know, he's, he's repeated what has been said before that uh, he's back on the project and he's hoping to be able to make progress. His question was mostly about, you know, not being sure what is expected of him in terms of report to the TSC and all. And basically I reassured him saying, you know, it's not like we're trying to kill it. And so if he can make progress, you know, we're definitely going to let him do that. So. I just encourage everybody to look at it and uh, comment. Uh, I don't think he's online, so on the call. So you can, resp you can post uh, comments and questions to the wiki page if you have any questions. Moving on, the last one is Caliper. Attila posted the um, report. He didn't raise any questions or issues for the TSC. Um, I don't know if anybody has any. I know he's on the call and he offered to answer questions that might uh, be raised during the call. Hearing none, I guess there isn't any. Well, thanks Attila for being here and anyway, so let's move on. Let's get to the discussion part of the agenda. Um, so first, Gary, you the only one who missed the call last time. As a new member of the TSC, I invited all the new members 
to take a moment to tell us what they would like to see the TSC do maybe differently than we've done to date. And so what's your interest in the TSC, you know? Um, yeah, I, I guess on, uh, I mean, on, on a few things, right? I think uh, that's, that's why I uh, went into the rat hole on that one. I think it'd be interesting to have more technical discussions, um, right? And maybe we can figure out, you know, to bring up, you know, subjects and things like that on that. I guess it's a fine line between, you know, having those discussions as, um, you know, in the, in, in the actual projects themselves or sometimes on some of these reviews, even maybe of, of, of projects, right? It could be, you know, discussion kind of like we had there. I think it's kind of interesting. So I think definitely, you know, more on the, on, on the technical side there. And, and, I, and I guess even some technical stuff on, you know, things, things, across, things across projects. I mean, even tools and other things like that. Um, I personally, you know, find that we're too loosey. I think we're getting better. I think we're too loosey goosey on expectations set across all projects from a technical perspective, both from life cycle, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to see perhaps more of that, more similar to Apache, and and then having a, and having a TSC actually come up with ideas in that in that space. All right. Sounds good. And, you know, I'll say, I'll repeat what I said last time because you weren't there. It's, you know, from a technical point of view, I don't know anybody who would like, who wouldn't like to have more technical discussion, just like we had. And uh, so the problem is we do have process oriented questions, like what's left on the agenda for today that we still have to tackle because we have a gap. Hopefully, you know, this won't take us forever to solve and address and and then we once we have put those to rest we can focus the the agendas to more technical matters i think everybody would like that so i'm definitely you know in favor of that but, well, don't you don't you come up with the agendas are now so do i have you to blame for the non-technical nature of this agenda <laughs> <What>? yes you can <laughs> But hey, the agenda is a wiki page and everybody's invited to participate in putting it together. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to remind everyone of that fact. And take a look at the uh, decision log or the backlog at the bottom, right? And anyone can add to this backlog. These are all wiki pages. So if there's a, something that you want to bring up to the TSC, you can add a page here trivially. And uh, I would like to echo Arnaud's uh, statement there. This is also a wiki page, so if you don't like where it's going, you know, jump in, make an edit. Okay, I have a question. Um, so, when I took a look at the agenda yesterday, um, I was surprised to see that there were some discussion items that we were probably going to end up voting on. Um, you look at that backlog, it's in alphabetical order. Is there some way to know what it is that we're going to focus on for the next meeting so that we can make sure to spend time on those items before we get to the point where we're like, oh, we want you to vote on this? So my point, my, the way I'm looking at this is what's in the discussion um, is highlights of some of the points that are in the backlog. And this is what I hope we can vote on. And we might get to the rest if we ever you know, have more time, but so far this has not been, you know, historically, as you know, the TSC usually is pretty short on time. So we don't really have that luxury most of the time, but uh, that's the idea. I do highlight all these things, product life cycle issue six, TSC co-chair, TSC size, are items that are in the backlog. And they are the ones that I've highlighted for this today's call. Yeah, I guess what I'm, I'm saying Arno is I understand that they were in the backlog I just didn't understand they were the ones we were going to focus on this week and so I didn't spend time on them until yesterday evening and I have some thoughts about at least the TSC size one and the discussion that's been going on there but um, like it was late last night when I looked at it and I haven't been able to comment on it and so I guess I'm just saying I, I want to make sure I have enough preparation time on the items that we are going to discuss for the week uh, before, like the day before. Okay, fair enough. And, and you know, I, I don't actually, I mean, the fact that I put them on the agenda for discussion doesn't mean I just expect a straight vote and nobody has the right to comment. <laughs> and so, 
you may very well say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not ready for us to vote on this today. And, you know, I will totally honor that request to, to defer, but, you know, or even stop the discussion if, you know, that's the right thing to do, uh, or if you're ready to do that. So, uh, you know, and I appreciate, you know, this is kind of a new process that I'm trying to put in place. Uh, so we all have to get used to it. And, you know, I didn't, I probably could have done a better job at communicating the uh, the process I wanted to try and use. So No worries. We'll, we'll work through it together. Okay. So any other questions on the process or how the agenda is set up since we're talking about this? And, you know, I very much welcome feedback. I'm myself trying to sort it out and figure it out, right? So just just to whine, I, I miss the push model of the TSC agenda getting emailed. Um, I get so many Confluence emails a day that it's hard to figure out which ones are just someone creating a page to see if something works versus here's the TSC agenda that has been set now and it's not going to change. <clears throat> yeah. I. I have the same complaint, Mark. That's, I don't know, Rye or Salona, if there's any way of cutting down on the spam from uh, Confluence. If you go into Confluence and go under notifications, you can go through and customize things pretty dramatically. So I would. Person. Yeah, I would go in and yeah, it's for each individual. Each individual has complete control over their notifications and you can go in and prioritize and do a bunch of different things in regards to that. So I highly recommend going in there and getting familiar with that. But is there a way? Yeah, then I, I think though, to Mark's point, it would be maybe nice if either Ryan or Arno or whoever would send out a specific email saying, here's the agenda so that we don't. Yeah, I can do that. That's fine. I, I almost did it uh, earlier <laughs> uh, yesterday. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm happy to do that. I was already tempted to do it, so it's fine. I can do that. When I put the agenda together and I feel like, okay, it's stable enough, I'll send an email saying, hey, okay, have a look and see if you want to add anything or what. There may still be changes, the wiki, so anybody can make changes. I can't guarantee that yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it's not going to change at all, but at least I can send you an email to say, hey, you know, I think that's the most of the meat is there. All right. And some of this if is you make like changes, that's when you get that's when you get notified. Anything you change, you get notified on automatically, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and so some of this is, is proactive and, and designed to be asynchronous. So like as you have time during the week going in and checking on the backlog on the items that you haven't reviewed before or checking in on conversations that you have been engaged in. Um, then it's sort of less important when the final agenda is built because you're already up to speed on those things. Yeah. All right. So let's try and make progress on some of the issues that I've highlighted. The first one of, or the first ones have to do with issue six. You know, so we have had quite a bit of discussion over time as to whether we should have some kind of formal sub-project structure. And the heart for one was a proponent of, you know, making that happen. And uh, there was quite a bit of discussion on the, you know, as part of the project lifecycle uh, task force. But I, you know, my feeling was, well, at the end of the day, we didn't really have any form of consensus one way or another, but it seemed to me the majority, you know, didn't seem to be in favor of creating a structure. And so I, after quite a bit of rambling, I put together that one resolution that says, well, we're not going to have formal sub projects. And so that's the proposal that I'm putting before the the TSC today. So, uh, and as an implementation ahead, detail, sorry. what you mean is that I, I just want to make sure that this is all like spoken, right? So, for instance, sure. Fabric can create a sub project called Fabric SDK Foo and not have to get any blessing from the TSC and not generate any reports. And That's furthermore, right. and if the Fabric uh, group, if the Fabric uh, project decides that Fabric SDK Foo is deprecated, they can archive that without any say so or anybody 
having a vote on that. They can just do it. Yeah, and that also means that when we do TSC reports from the project, they should include you know reports on all the different sub projects, like the like the different SDKs and things like this. And so, just to finish the the corollary to this uh, proposal is the six point two, which basically says, okay, there were historically we have had some projects being you know presented to the TSC as new projects, so they were actually proposed through the HIP process and approved, but we never really handled them, managed them in any shape or form like top level projects, right? So we don't have reports from the, the chain tool uh, project, for instance. And, and you know, so there's a, there's a corollary proposal, which is to say, officially, we're rescinding these from top level projects nomination, even though they're not surface. So it's really purely administrative at this point. We're just saying, okay, all of these things are really part of Fabric. I don't know of any so, others that are, you know, it seems all of those are related to Fabric, in, in fact. Yeah, so and so the Go SDK has actually made a request. Um, I missed the last maintainers meeting, so I don't know the status of it, but um, to actually join Fabric, so it would become a sub-project, effectively, um, of, of Fabric. Um, Python SDK is still sort of independent, um, I mean, again, we can look at that. I don't know if that was on or um, anybody from there. We could look at, at doing that chain tool. I, I don't even know if that's still being used to be quite honest. Yeah, I know. Um, so I had a discussion with uh, Greg about the, during the migration from Garrett you, you found to GitHub. <laughs> I did, surprisingly. And, and I asked <laughs> if the project should be deprecated and he said it's still um, he's still willing to do it. It's basically stable. Um, so they're going forward. I don't know what they want to do in, in terms of becoming a sub project or anything like that. But yeah, he's alive. Okay, but I would consider. Well, it really can't become a sub project because we removed support for it in Fabric. <laughs> right, exactly. So. Um, okay, but hold on. Let, let's not get uh, too much into this right now because but, so there are two parts, right? The first is we don't we agree that we are not going to have formal sub projects uh, with the structure, right? So, and uh, hierarchical projects per se. Right, and, but, and and so but what I wanted to say again, going through these things, I I think if somebody comes along and they say to the fabric maintainers or the sawtooth maintainers, hey, we'd like to create a project you know, FUBAR um, as a sub-project of Sawtooth or whatever. And the Sawtooth maintainers decided, you know, I'm not sure if we really, if that's really something that everybody really wants or, you know, we're not really necessarily prepared to support it and so forth. Then I don't see any reason why somebody couldn't come along and say, I'd like to create Project Foo at, just as a top level. No, and that's correct. And in fact, I right. hope I was trying to find where that is. I may have lost it in there. But, uh, and this is what has been happening, right? Uh, under the leadership of Dan, actually, as the, the chair of the TSE, he, you know, we have had a few proposals made where we said, well, that looks like very fabric specific. Why don't you talk to the fabric maintainers and see whether you should really do that as part of fabric or is it a lab? And so all of these are still possible. We're not saying you cannot exist outside of fabric if, if you're somehow related to fabric. Yes, yeah, so that's that's resolution 6.5. Yes, I think that's the last one. Oh, that's that's the bottom of the screen okay. there. Yeah. Wait, I think I they're, they're either all conflated, right? Yeah, it's all one really. I think it has to be one thing. So I, I think one of the issues I'm struggling with internally is to me things like fabric and sawtooth are top level projects right maybe we need like a different category for projects like a major project and a minor project <laughs> um, well just so you know if I want to come in and propose something doctor doctor and sawtooth, captain and captain <laughs> well just propose something for sawtooth that Sawtooth doesn't want and suddenly becomes a top level project and gets <clears throat> the same publicity as Sawtooth and Fabric where it's really, you know, a wrapper around one of their APIs or something, you know? Mm. 
<clears throat> so if they don't want it, it automatically becomes a top level project. Well, it still has to get through TSC. So if yeah. there's feedback like, hey, this is just a wrapper around Sawtooth and hopefully the committee <laughs> shuts that down. But Sawtooth doesn't want it. So, but I need it for what I'm doing. Therefore, does Hyperledger just say, no, we don't want it? Go somewhere else with it? Well, no, but I think that that's a function of many of the labs, in fact, are, you know, sort of small extensions or whatever, you know, um, uh, that, uh, you know, either wrap the SDK or whatever and add some new functionality. Um, just, there's a lot of those out there. And I think that's a healthy thing. Okay. Well, I just, you know, where you have, you know, essentially, and, and again, maybe labs, I, 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 I wrestle with the whole, the whole concept of, you know, a lab or a major project and a minor project. Uh, some labs are, you know, really just here's a sample and they, that's the end of that. Then other things, it, indeed, maybe some sort of an extension that's only useful in one domain and uh, doesn't really become part of the core, but it's still very valuable. Uh, but so the proposal, the first we have to agree is the six one, which is we don't have hierarchical projects. We have a flat structure. We have different categories. Indeed, we have labs and projects, and we can still play with that for certain things that feel like, okay, maybe we're not willing to put that as a top level project. And have, as Mark pointed out, all the resources put into this, whether it's PR, CI, and you know, security audits and all this stuff. Yeah, for, for me, six one is easy because it's meant to stop the situation where Sawtooth or Fabric says, no, that doesn't look like it's architecturally consistent with, with our project. We, we don't want that feature. And the TSC says, too bad, that's part of your project now. <laughs> Indeed. So can we agree to that? I would like to put that one before the TSC as a formal proposal. Can I, can I uh, ask a question about Sure. This one? Sure. So, uh, so I, I kind of see this pattern between there's a lab, there's a high level project, and then there's these things we don't want to call sub projects, but they still kind of uh, exist. Um, how are these top level projects expected to govern um, these not sub projects, not minor projects, but whatever you want to call them? Um, I guess part of my question is you end up with maybe two levels of maintainers in this situation. Um, you can see that with um, Fabric and a couple of the, whatever you want to call these sub-projects. Um, you can see it in Aries where there's multiple um, framework projects with their own <coughs> maintainer count. Um, what, what is the actual role of the top level project in something like Aries or uh, what we uh, call the maintainers of those? I, I think, I'm sorry, this is Brian, I don't mean to jump in, but um, but I put this in a comment. Um, I think it is important for, you know, the maintainers of a project like Fabric to be kind of a single set, and that set should include the maintainers on these um, additional pieces of code, if we don't want to call them sub-projects. Um, um, you know, and, and that, you know, there's that group of maintainers is still what's accountable to the TSC, they still work together to create the report, that sort of thing. Um, but I wouldn't want to see precisely what you describe as kind of two levels of, a, of, of maintainership or one group of maintainers that reports to another group of maintainers. Um, it should really be just one unified group. And that's partly the basis for deciding should this new code base be within this project or not. You know, those existing maintainers are essentially adding to their, their responsibilities and, and hopefully adding to their, their population as well. Yeah, and uh, to clarify, I, I find this a bit disturbing because I realize, you know, there's different ways you can interpret the proposed resolution. I mean, the proposed resolution is actually to avoid this kind of hierarchy. So if somehow we end up with the sense that there is some hierarchy, that the SDK Go maintainers for Fabric are lesser than, you know, <laughs> the Fabric core maintainers, I think this defeats the point. It's I'm thinking of this, we have a flat list of maintainers of all the different fabric related repos. 
I think, I, 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 I mean, that, but that becomes problematic. I, I, I think that becomes problematic, right? I mean, you can say, well, maybe it isn't because people are in there and then they, you know, they only do, they only end up reporting on whatever. I, I mean, I'm not, this is not just the fabric, but let's just talk about, S, I mean, SDKs are probably a big thing because Aries is going to have them and whatever, right? And, and again, I just go to things that I know. I look at Kafka. Kafka says, look, we're going to be the Kafka project and we're going to provide a Java, a Java SDK that's officially supported as part of our thing. And that's what's under Apache. Apache Kafka, they have an official Kafka release, they have a official Java release. There's 10 other SDKs out there. Now, half of them are created by the guys that LinkedIn bought or that Confluence bought from LinkedIn and other stuff, but and they create their SDKs over there and they test them and they say what's certified on them. So I, I think this is where things get, you know, tricky, right? Because if I'm a person on a project, right, and people come in and have a project and have the stuff, my expectation is that anything that's in here and classified as release or whatever it is should work. And, and on the other side, right, I think that a lot of people don't go in and review. I mean, maybe it's not a problem because you just put one big list and you say that the people are in there. But I'll be honest, most people aren't capable of reviewing some of the stuff. So why would I want somebody merging something? I mean, we can revert and get into battles there. So, so I mean, maybe it's a trust thing. I don't know. So, Brian, if you're suggesting we have one massive list and then you have code owners and assigning, uh, that, I, that, that could work, I guess. Confused. Wait, um, wait, Gary. Gary, I didn't mean to say we have everybody be maintainer of all the repos because that's what you seem to be describing. Well, I thought that's kind of what... That's kind of what was implied. Brian, that's, yeah, I, I, that's well, what then, I thought Brian I think, said. Yeah, yeah, I mean... I think then it becomes <laughs> clear that then we don't really have agreement on what this means. Um, I mean, again, you know, taking Gary's point, though, there's also examples where there is a sort of a top level project and then there are a bunch of projects that are definitely related and typically, you know, sort of go with the flow and but they often have different maintainers. Um, and that's simply because of area of expertise. Right. So, I mean, I take a look at, for instance, OpenStack. The OpenStack had a defined release structure. The release of OpenStack itself, though, was defined by the um, the architecture uh, technical committee. Um, and uh, but then each of the projects had different set of committers or maintainers. And um, uh, and in fact, in some cases, you even have different parts of the code base for a particular sub project, whatever you want to call it, a particular repo um, that people had authority over. And so, you know, I, I think, again, within a project, I think it's entirely uh, likely that you're going to have, you know, a Java expert be responsible for the Java SDK and a Go expert as the, you know, Go as, and so on and so forth. Um, and they may be different people and maybe they are, or maybe they aren't part of the top level set of quote unquote maintainers, but um, and that's a, a project gets to sort of decide for itself how it wants to be governed. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Google Code Review does manage this. They have a package level permissions, like yeah. an owner's file that says who can who can sanction the thing. I mean, that's partly. I mean, they're, they're a mono repo, but um, I mean, I don't. I think there's a case where like maintainers get actively antagonistic towards each other, but presumably in the majority <laughs> of the cases, it's, it's governance by consent for this. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to mention that I, I brought up Fabric and Aries for two reasons. One of them is because I'm personally involved in them, but also because those are two distinct examples of different kinds of projects. Fabric having this kind of, um, you know, top level project and SDKs and components kind of um, in an in ecosystem. But Aries is, is, is a different animal because you end up with kind of this peer to peer system and there's not really a top level project to speak of. It's just, you know, a bunch of uh, frameworks and, and SDKs that should talk to each other. So um, they're, they're definitely distinct animals. And um, it's not entirely clear to me what we mean by maintainers um, of the project as a whole uh, versus uh, code owners of a, of a component, if that's what we're, what we're, what we're talking about now. So I think that, that's that exactly could make sense, but the yeah. the point of this is that as the TSC, we don't need to get into that. What we're not going to do as the TSC is force some project or some community into an existing one. 
Right, but then I'm going to say that we can't vote that there's no sub projects because clearly well, they won't, they're I, not I, sub projects. Yeah. They're just projects, right? I mean, I, I think you have to say that. Look, I think there's a there's a defined life cycle, right? I mean, maybe what you're really saying here there's projects and there's not projects. We can classify stuff as frameworks or whatever. That's not up to me. But you're either a project and you're so either a lab or you're a project. And if you're accepted as a project, you're either an incubation. Uh, Brian will shoot me, but you know whatever the life cycle is, right? <laughs> That's, well, I, I think hear, that's I, really I, what six one is saying. No. Uh, so yes. No, so I, the, I, the, well, this is what this is about: is do we continue to have things like you know Fabric Go SDK officially labeled as a top level project, or is that just considered to be part of Fabric? I, I think that's hard and to resolve if we don't just if we don't resolve what are kind of roles in a project and what does it mean to be. Um, is there a second class of maintainer at this point? And what I think, if we can resolve it, how can my, we vote what on I'm this? hearing here is there, there's there's not a second class of maintainer from the TSC's perspective, and from a project decision making process, we think of all the maintainers of sub repositories as maintainers of the overall project, and then those maintainers need to figure out how they're going to work together and how they're going to manage whatever pecking order they think they need to accomplish their project's purpose. And, and uh, you know, I think, I mean, from the, I thank you, Nef, this is correct. This fits my mental model. And, and to me, it's not different than what's happening today. Today, we have different repos at Fabric and every other project. They, we all have different repos and not, main, the maintainers are not the same on all the repos, right? So I don't think anybody is suggesting we change that. What I meant by, you know, we have a flat list. There is no second citizen, the second class maintainers. They all are maintainers on the same level. And that's... Yeah, it's a status quo thing. All right. So we're running out of time, but I'm glad we had this discussion. Clearly, we still have to do some clarification about what is meant. So I guess we'll close it for this, uh, for today on this. I encourage people to look and use the wiki offline. We'll get back to it next week. Hopefully we'll be in better shape to have a crisper proposal that everybody understands and we can vote on. And the same goes for the other uh, topics that are in the, in the discussion section of the agenda for today. All right. I will close the call on this so we respect everybody's time. Thank you all for joining. Talk to you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.